all humans have the potential to achieve something incredible. But there are a select few who not only fully commit themselves to excellence, but if enough people are so lucky as to hear about them and their wisdom, become legends in the eyes of the generations to come. Stories are constantly unfolding of humans who strive to push the boundaries and help us redefine what is possible. Individuals who pushed the human limits by seemingly defying nature will inspire you with their dedication and the mysteries surrounding their lives will fascinate you. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three incredible individuals. Li Ching Yuan Us humans have always been captivated by the idea of dodging our own mortality, looking in awe to those surpassing even the 100-year mark. The 250-year mark, then, seems mind-blowingly unachievable. However, in the 1920s, it was reported that one Chinese man, Li Ching Yuan, had done the impossible and surpassed 250 years of life. This is one of the longest human lifespans ever reported, apart from Greek legends and other myths, and while this achievement is not entirely proven, it is backed up through more than just stories. According to the New York Times, a dean at Minkuo University discovered records documenting Li Ching Yuan's birth at Chongqing, China in the year 1677. Since his death was reported in 1933, this puts his total living years at 256. Other evidence for his impressive lifespan comes from interviews in Li's neighborhood, where the elder men claimed to have known Li as a grown man when they were just children. To put his longevity into perspective, the United Nations estimates that the global average human lifespan is 72.6 years. The Guinness Book of World Records formally recognizes a French woman who died at 122 years of age as the longest lived person. The 256 years which Li Cheng Yuan has reportedly lived is such a long period of time that he allegedly married 23 different women. It is also reported that he fathered 200 children. Legend says that on his deathbed he told his friend, I did everything I was supposed to do in this world, I'm going home. Adding to his impressiveness was his wisdom. Li Ching Yuan passed down what he believed to be the secrets to his longevity. One way he kept himself extremely fit was through his practice of the martial art Qi Gong, which he learned from an apprenticeship with a hermit that he believed to be 500 years old. Li went on to teach others this art at the ripe age of 71. Qi Gong improves both physical and mental health, incorporating posture, exercise, and breathing techniques. Li Qing Yuan's diet, which consisted mainly of herbs and rice wine, may have also helped to extend his life. He was a herbalist himself, a career he started at age 10, foraging for and selling plants like goji berries and ginseng. Descriptions of Li Qing Yuan have him standing seven feet tall with impressive eyesight, extremely long fingernails and a healthy complexion, which certainly aligns with a physically nourishing lifestyle. However, these practices of the body are not what he himself identified as the reason for his long life. He attributed his everlasting health to his peaceful mind. When he asked the secret to his longevity, he replied, Keep a quiet heart. Sit like a tortoise, walk sprightly like a pigeon, and sleep like a dog. This quote lives on to this day and captures his eternal wisdom. The Mummified Monk You may associate mummification with ancient Egypt, but it turns out not every mummy is found inside of a sarcophagus. In 2015, the Siberian Times reported the discovery of 200-year-old remains of a Mongolian monk frozen in the lotus position. It seems the powerful and natural process of decomposition was no match for the icy Mongolian climate. Though the cold conditions may serve as the explanation for this phenomenon, the preservation of human remains for two centuries is still a rare feat of nature, even in the chill, and the monk's resting lotus position seems to symbolize a meditative state of eternal worship. The lotus position is also known as the Varya position in Tibetan Buddhism and it is achieved through sitting in a cross-legged position with each foot being placed on the opposite thigh. The position of the feet should be as even as possible. The soles of the feet are meant to face upwards and the heels of each foot are instructed to be positioned near the abdomen. 
The Buddha is commonly depicted in the lotus position, and this position is said to stabilize the body, increasing stamina, and facilitating proper breathing. The pose is meant to resemble an actual lotus flower, which symbolizes purity and an enlightened mind in Buddhist traditions. Due to this meditative state he was discovered in, senior Buddhists declared that the monk was not actually dead, but in a deep trance called Tukdam. Perhaps his resting position does not merely symbolize eternal worship, but is a sign of it. In certain Buddhist traditions, it is said that a person can remain in the Tukdam meditative state even after complete physical death for many days. It is believed that from this state of meditation, where the body shuts down and the mind goes on, one can become a Buddha. Recognizing how rare and incredible the condition of the monk was, a man actually stole the corpse to sell on the black market. The transportation of the monk fortunately led to the intervention and discovery by scientists, which thankfully in turn caused the monk to be reported internationally for the whole world to marvel at. The mystery behind the monk's identity adds even more intrigue to this story. It is speculated that the body belongs to the teacher of Lama Dashidorzo Itigilov, who was also found mummified. It is said that Itigilov warned his students of death, began meditating, and then also died in the lotus position. According to legend, the Lama was buried and unearthed twice, well preserved each time. Today, his final resting place is in a Buddhist temple where he will be worshipped forever. Whoever this mummified monk is, it seems that even in the seconds before his death, he remained peaceful and connected to his way of life. Zuo C. Pushing the limits of longevity is one thing, but what about breaking the laws of physics? In many ancient documents, humans are reported to perform incredible acts of magic. One of these historical mystical humans is Zuo Si. Zuo Si was a legendary man of the Chinese Eastern Han Dynasty, the second imperial dynasty in China. Although his birth and death dates are a mystery, historical texts claim that he lived to be 300 years old. It is believed that he achieved this through a mentorship with Taoist sage Feng Heng, who taught him magic and longevity. Zuo Si is thought to have studied atop a mountain in Taizhou, where he practiced Taoism and also studied Confucianism and astrology. One of his paths to longevity was through Taoist sexual practices, which supposedly enhanced health and spirit and extended life. Taoists referred to these sexual practices as joining energy. Simon was thought to contain a lot of Jing, which was the energetic matter in the body. Jing was also thought to be connected to life force, known as Qi. The goal was to conserve as much bodily fluid as possible because the depletion of all the Jing in the body through the loss of fluids led to death. Therefore, it was a goal for men to avoid ejaculation. However, it was believed that when men and women had as much sex as possible, women would extend the life of men when men absorbed Jing energy from women. Female satisfaction was extremely important because it created more Jing to be transferred to the man. So that's how Zuo Qi pulled off 300 years. Zuo Qi was also taught alchemy and applied his knowledge to medicine, gaining notoriety for performing healings and extending the life of others with his cures. He was also known to have gone extended periods of time without food and to have displayed divine powers. Reports of his magic acts include walking through walls, teleporting and summoning various objects. Many of his practices did not completely align with Confucianism, and this led to his prosecution by strict Confucians, such as the warlord Sun Shi, who tried to kill Zuo Si by chasing him on horseback. It is believed Zuo Si escaped by manipulating time or space, as the horse never caught up to him despite him seemingly walking slowly. It is also reported that Cao Cao, the Grand Chancellor of the Han Dynasty, tried to execute him as well, with Zuo Si once more using magic to escape, this time hiding himself among a flock of sheep. While many may not believe these acts are possible and that the reports of Zuo Si's life are just stories, it is incredible enough that he displayed the discipline required to sit atop a mountain and dedicate his entire life to studying so many different practices. He makes an impact on the present day through his appearances in pop culture. Today, 
Zuo Si appears as a character in the historical novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms and is also a playable character in the video game series Dynasty Warriors. Candido Amantini Born in Italy in 1914, Candido Amantini was to become a great Catholic passionist priest in Rome. His official title destined to be that of Reverend Father Candido of the Immaculate, a master exorcist, spiritual director and confessor. From 1961 until he passed away in 1992, Candido Amantini was the saving grace of Rome, renowned for his exorcisms. The priest would see anywhere from 60 to 80 people in a single day, pleading for assistance. He was stationed at the Church of the Holy Staircase, and as well as being an exorcist, he additionally taught sacred scripture and moral theology, even wrote a novel about the Virgin Mary. In his childhood, Amantini was the second of four children, born to Giovanni Battista Amantini and Dialinda Frattini Amantini, a faithful Catholic family. The future priest was baptised exactly eight days after his birth. At the mere age of 12, he entered the Passionist Minor Seminary in Rome in October of 1926, and by the time he was only 16, he began studies at the Passionist Novitiate on Mount Argentario in the retreat of St. Joseph. It is here where he was gifted the name of Candido of the Immaculate and took his temporary vows as Passionist. In 1936, after he concluded all his priestly studies, including those of philosophy and theology in Lucca, he took his eternal vows as a Passionist, transferring to the Church of the Holy Staircase, where he studied to attain a degree in theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, which he got in 1941. He passed away after a long illness on the feast of Saint Candido, his patron saint since his passing. The Vatican has gifted him the title of Servant of God, and his beatification is still being investigated by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. The priest spoke Hebrew, Greek, German and Sanskrit alongside Italian. His exorcism studies, however, came from Father Alessandro Caletti, exorcist of the Diocese of Arezzo, who taught him and even helped him conduct his first exorcism under his guidance. Saint Padre Pio of Pietrelcina said Father Candido is a priest according to God's heart. Father Candido was a man of God, always calm, always smiling, never angry even with the devil. He was on everyone's lips, well known in Rome, and has exorcised for 36 years without ever stopping. Don Amorth, who claims that Father Candido could see a photograph and immediately tell whether someone required an exorcism or medical care. The priest helped hundreds of faithful throughout his life, exorcising many people from bad spirits and demons alike. Don Amorth claims that the devil was afraid of Father Candido, who consistently cast him out of the bodies of victims. Candido allegedly had conversations with the devil during some exorcisms, where he would mock the devil with his faith and love in God. Don Amorth conducted exorcisms with Father Candido from 1986 to 1990 and became his successor. The Pollock Twins Reincarnation, also known as rebirth or transmigration, is one theory about it not being the end when you pass away believed by many cultures. Some believe that the birth of a set of twins proves that reincarnation is real. On the 5th of May 1957, a tragedy struck the Pollock family in Hexham, England, and their two daughters, 11-year-old Joanna and 6-year-old Jacqueline, passed away due to a car accident on their way to church. The girls passed away almost instantaneously, and another child, a friend, passed away on the way to hospital. The driver was a woman who had been forcibly separated from her own children and reportedly tried to take her own life by driving after taking aspirin and phenobarbitone. The case made headlines across Britain. On the 4th of October 1958, Joanna and Jacqueline's mother, Florence Pollock, gave birth to a set of identical twins, named Gillian and Jennifer. The similarities between the twins and the deceased girls started to show at birth. The twins, although identical, had different birthmarks. 
Jennifer had a birthmark on her left hip that was similar to the one that Jacqueline had in the same position. Also, she had a small birthmark on her forehead that resembled a scar Jacqueline got from falling in a bucket aged three years old. The parents moved the family to Whitley Bay, England to get a fresh start before the twins turned one. As the twins grew, they began to say and remember things that they should not have known. The girls began to ask for their deceased sister's toys by name, despite those toys being kept away. Once the twins were four years old, the family moved back to Hexham and the strange occurrences continued. The girls were able to name landmarks they had never seen. They knew the favourite locations of their deceased sisters and believed that they had attended school where Jacqueline and Joanna were enrolled when they passed away. The girls were also terrified of cars and running engines. It got stranger. Florence noticed Jennifer and Gillian playing chilling games. Gillian cradled Jennifer's head saying, there's blood coming out of your eyes. According to their father, John, the twins often talked about the accident between themselves. The twins had similar tastes for foods, clothes, and music as their deceased sisters. However, all memories of their past life seemed to disappear shortly after the twins turned five. Some people believe that these twins prove that reincarnation is real. Others said the girls were influenced by their older brothers. The twins were studied by a psychologist named Dr. Ian Stevenson, who researched proof of reincarnation in children. They were just one of many cases of reincarnation that the psychologists studied. The twins were covered in one of Stevenson's books, which also contained 13 other cases. In total, Stevenson studied over 2,500 cases of reincarnation over a 40-year career. A question still remains regarding reincarnation, but the case of the Pollock twins is compelling evidence. Natasha Demkina in Saransk, Russia, a baby was born in 1987. This baby was Natalia Demkina, known as Natasha, who would grow up to have alleged X-ray vision. The Russian woman claims that she can see inside the human body, giving her the unique ability to make medical diagnoses without the need for an actual examination. By the age of 10, young Natasha was already doing medical readings for the Russian people. She was featured on the Discovery Channel both in the United Kingdom and in Japan in 2004. In 2006, she started to use her miraculous powers publicly, setting up the Center of Special Diagnostics of Natalia Demkina, or TSSD for short. The purpose of the TSSD was for Natasha and other healers involved with the organization to help diagnose and treat various maladies by using unusual abilities, folk healing and traditional medicine. Natasha explained, I was at home with my mother and suddenly I had a vision. I could see inside my mother's body and I started telling her about the organs I could see. She revealed that after she informed her mother that she was able to see the organs inside her, the word of her abilities spread around the community. Local people would come to her wanting insight into the condition of their health. In 2003, a newspaper picked up on the story and she was invited to the UK, Japan and New York to demonstrate her powers. In the UK, she gave demonstrations of her skills, after which all her diagnoses were placed alongside those of professional doctors. One of her demonstrations impressed the daytime host of This Morning Britain by pointing out the fact that she had a sore ankle and the Discovery Channel claimed that she managed to identify the fractures and even metal pins stuck in a woman who had been in a terrible car crash. Her talents were, at first, believed and applauded, but after she left the country, it became clear that she had made several mistakes with her diagnoses. The worst one of all being the diagnosis she gave to Chris Steele, a television physician. She claimed he had various problems, such as kidney stones and a serious issue with his gallbladder, among other things, but it turned out he was in pristine health and had no ailments at all. She was taken to New York to showcase her skills in the documentary The Girl with X-Ray Eyes, where she was tested by researchers from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The people she diagnosed explained they felt her diagnoses were accurate. Many of the patients were impressed with her, but the scientists were sceptical, 
claiming instead that the phenomenon is akin to that of fortune tellers, nothing more, as her diagnoses were often faulty, according to researcher Richard Wiseman. Ray Hyman, Richard Wiseman and Andrew Skolnick were the leading researchers conducting their tests on Natasha and came to the conclusion she did not show enough proof of having the acclaimed ability to be studied any further. Natasha Demkina managed to correctly diagnose basic conditions in four or six patients, but needed to get at least five or six correct in order for more experiments to be carried out. Demkina and her supporters argued about the conditions under which she was tested, primarily their unfairness towards her. Brian Josephson, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and supporter of parapsychology, heavily criticised Ray Hyman's methods, questioning the scientists' motives and then accused them of having some kind of plot to discredit the teenage claimed psychic. Brian Josephson's argument was that Natasha managed to get four of six patient diagnoses correct. The chances of that were 1 in 50 or 2% alone, and that fact, according to him, should be considered. Demkina had more testing at the Tokyo Electrical University in Japan, where she was further tested by Professor Yoshio Mashi. Since the early 2000s, not much has been heard from Demkina. William Bates Back in 1902 in New York, a well-known doctor by the name of William Bates sends a messenger to deliver a note to his wife. My dear wife, it says, I am called out of town to some major operations. I go with Dr. Forsh, an old student, to do a mastoid, some cataracts, and other operations. He promises me a bonanza. Too bad to miss the horse show, but I am glad to get so much money for us all. I am in such a flurry. Do not worry, I will write details later. Yours lovingly, Willie. It was not out of the ordinary for the doctor to be called away on spontaneous moments like this, but his wife, Ada Seaman Bates, found something in the note puzzling. Dr. Bates was already particularly successful as one of the foremost optometrists in the city. They were already very well off, and the doctor was also not one to talk about money like this. However, Ada set this to the back of her mind and thought nothing more of it. That is, until several days had passed, and the good doctor had still not returned home. His disappearance prompted a search, not only by the local police precinct in New York City, but a wider net cast internationally by the Freemasons, the elusive organization that William Bates himself was a member of. Months passed and no news came Ada's way, up until a letter arrived at her door. News from the chapter of Freemasons based across the Atlantic, three and a half thousand miles away in London. A character resembling Dr. Bates had been located in a London hospital, but he was not living his day-to-day -day as a senior optometrist. He was merely a medical assistant. The mystery only deepened when it was revealed he first came to the hospital not as a doctor, but as a patient. When he first arrived, he was so emaciated he could barely stand, looking haggard and thin, his eyes deeply sunken. This for a man whose sizable bank account should have ensured a life of luxury wherever he travelled to. Ada made the journey to England at once, but this was not to be a happy reunion. Ada Bates's joy upon seeing her husband again was short-lived. She was met with a blank stare from her long-lost husband. I don't know why you bother, madame, he said. We are strangers. But she was not one to let their long-standing marriage disappear like her husband had. He was persuaded by her, albeit begrudgingly, to move in with her to the Savoy Hotel where they might rekindle their relationship anew. Her efforts wouldn't pay off. As a day later, William Bates snuck out of their room, never to be seen by her again. Ada never stopped searching, sending private investigators throughout Europe and the eastern seaboard, but all in vain. She died clutching a photo of him, heavy-hearted and in anguish. But Dr. Bates's story would not end there. Eight years later, an acquaintance visiting Grand Forks, a small town of 12,000, stumbled upon a man who cast a great similarity to William. Again, there followed a clear lack of memories of his previous life. It was as if he had a chunk of his mind removed, like a slice of watermelon chopped away and eaten by an invisible monster, wrote the associate. Was this tale an episode of amnesia, or perhaps the aimless wondering a man looking to find something more than money in his life, but only ended up losing himself? Whatever the case, William Bates passed away in 1931, leaving this disappearing act a mystery forever.
But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.